Welcome to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. Our goal is to help you maximize your church's potential. You'll hear from top leaders in children's, student, and family ministry about the principles and practices they use. Now here's your host, Nick Blevins. Hello and welcome to episode 32 of the podcast. I'm Nick and I'm glad you're listening today as I talk with Jeff Cochran of YMLead.com. Jeff and I talk about leadership development strategies, tactics, systems, kind of everything they use at their church, Faith Promise Church, to lead youth ministry, to empower volunteers, uh, to onboard volunteers and do training. We talk about all of that and you're going to love it because not only does he break all of that down, he also shares some great stuff that you can get in the show notes. So some onboarding documents, volunteer checklists, uh, an ebook that he wrote about goals and setting goals. You can get all of that in the show notes at nickblevins.com slash episode 32. If you filled out that survey that we've had going now for the last few weeks about volunteer staffing and ratios, thank you. Almost 600 people filled it out, so we're going to have some great data from that survey. I'll be analyzing that and sharing it as soon as I can. I'll also be announcing those winners soon because I know that's what you want to know, who won all the conference tickets and all the different free things we gave away. So I'll be announcing that soon. Keep an eye out in your email inbox and on the blog at nickblevins.com and we'll share all those results. But let's go ahead and jump into my interview with Jeff Cochran. Well, today I'm joined by Jeff Cochran. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Thanks. Thanks for having me, Nick. So Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself and your family and your church. Sure, sure. I've been in student ministry now for about 12 years. Makes me feel kind of like a dinosaur saying that, but i um, been doing this thing for a long time. I've been at three churches um, across that time, and I really ran the gambit with different opportunities. Um, I've had the opportunity to start um, really two student ministries from scratch, from the ground up, and uh, you know, deal with a lot of just the complications and uh, you know, the questions that come with that. How do you start something from nothing? And now in my current role, um, we are loving it. My family's back home in East Tennessee at Faith Promise Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. And I'm the campus student pastor at our Pellissippi campus, which is our broadcast campus. Cool, cool. And you also uh, blog and share some youth ministry stuff, correct? And so I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about YM Lead. Uh, yeah, I run a leadership network, a website called YM Lead. And it's all about leadership through a youth ministry lens. Um, You know, the one thing that's holding student pastors back, student ministries back, and even really, you know, kids ministries back to a point across the country, you know, I don't think it's the talent level of people. There are some genius youth workers out there at churches that no one's ever heard of. Um, I don't think it's their love for God. I don't think it's their passion. Uh, But really, I think the one thing that holds so many youth workers back when I talk to them is the leadership component, especially as things grow and they get bigger. How do I lead students? How do I lead you know, my volunteers and, and leaders and then even lead to the families? So uh, we write, we uh, you know, blog, do different resources for you know, youth workers all the way across the country uh, just to really help them grow their leadership. So we believe if you grow your leadership, you grow the church. That's great. And I totally agree. And so we're going to talk about that here first. I grew up actually in a, uh, a student ministry that I would say maxed out at 80 students for this exact reason, you know, like uh, my youth pastor's the best guy ever. Uh, We're still friends today and he's like a mentor and a counselor for me. And, and just at that time, I would say, cause I'm a little bit older. um, I don't know that this was even now we're talking about it and there's a lot of writing about it in terms of leadership and growing, you know, a ministry that way. There just wasn't a lot of that back then. This was before any, almost any books that I can remember that were really helpful, especially if you're talking specific to student ministry. So I agree, and it's probably the same reason a lot of churches overall are less than 100 or less than 200 in size. There's many other reasons for that, but some of it is it's just a different thing to grow it right? Absolutely. To, from one place and to another place. So we're going to talk about that and what it looks like, so I th- hopefully this will be helpful for everyone. In terms of leadership development in your student ministry, how have you identified you know leaders and brought them on board, or maybe it's... So maybe it's recruiting, but maybe it's after they're already serving, but you need mm-hmm. them to lead. So now it's more than I'm giving you some a job and a task to do, but now I need you to lead sure. in some way. How do you identify them? Uh, absolutely. We do it in a couple of ways, uh, Nick. You know, Really, we start with recruiting, but we don't recruit every level of our student ministry. You know, We recruit what we call 
crew members, which is our security team, because we're uh, you know definitely a larger student ministry. So we recruit our security team and our traffic volunteers and you know all that sort of stuff. And then we recruit small group leaders. You know, we recruit them based on you know people that we've had conversations with you know in the lobby on a Sunday morning, and we see potential in them. Or we recruit them oftentimes by other good leaders that we have who say, hey, you know, I know somebody and I think they would be great at this, but they don't know it yet. You know, we need to have this conversation. Um, And then sometimes it really just comes to us through things like, you know, communication cards. Hey, I'm interested in, you know, serving in this area. So we, you know, we'll call them, give them a phone call, start up a conversation. And then we identify some things in them and say, hey, you know, this looks like someone who has potential to be a leader. They're very clear in their communication Um, The big thing that we always really ask is why? Why do you want to be, you know, a student ministry leader? Why do you want to be a small group leader? We get kind of that passionate side of it. Um, But a whole other piece to it is once someone said, yes, I want to be on board, our training process is not that easy. It's a, you know, it's time consuming. It takes about four weeks of training and another six week apprenticeship process before you ever hit the ground running with students with us. So it weeds out a lot of maybe the people who aren't ready to take that leadership step. And it gives us about 10 good solid weeks just to pour into them and kind of develop the basics of our vision, um, our mission, kind of our values and what we stand for. Uh, that's the recruiting side of how we initially get them in and begin to train them and develop them. We you know pair them in an apprenticeship process with another leader who's been doing it for a long time, somebody who's been you know doing their role for a long time and doing it well. Um, And they have kind of one on one coaching. Uh, But where we develop some of our best leaders is when we're actually pulling people into our specific roles of coaches and senior coaches, which is our higher level leaders. Those are the people who are leading small group leaders. They're leading crew leaders and they're leading, you know, high caliber adult leaders. So the way that we develop them is usually within our own system. Um, You know, once we have a small group leader in, we're, we're looking for who really stands out. Who can handle every bit of workload that we can give them? Who uh, goes above and beyond in the way they contact their students, um, the way that they love their students, you know, in their small group? Um, And if they can take everything that we've given them practically, you know, we kind of run down a list of what's expected for each role. If they can handle all that at a really high level, then we start asking the question, you know, are you ready to take another step? Is there another step for you with your your gifting? Um, Are you capable of leading leaders who lead students and not just leading students. So uh, from that point, it's really a a tap on the shoulder where we try to call out the greatness that we see in them, tell them exactly what we see and and why we believe that they're capable of of doing something more. Um, And then we just kind of start again. It's an apprenticeship process. They walk with someone who's been doing it and they see what it looks like, what it would take, um, what it looks like to be done well and get some time to pray about it, to come back, to discuss it with us and we decide whether they want to move forward with that or not. Are most of your coaches former small group leaders? Because you were saying, you know, you see who's doing it well. Is that how it works? <laughs> or do you recruit some that, you know, they didn't lead a small group ever, but they yeah. make good coaches? Most of our coaches are former small group leaders. Um, but we're beginning to see more and more where we find people who are excellent leaders within the church, have excellent potential, but haven't been able to find their fit. And as we talk to them, uh, you know, sometimes you just realize they're not going to be great with students, but they're great with people who are great with students. Um, So I would say the norm is that we get most of our coaches from people who've already done great as small group leaders or done great on the crew. Uh, But there are definitely times where we find people, you know, you'll sit down to have a lunch meeting with someone and just identify something in them. And I'll, I'll ask them to come on board straight as a coach. They go through our same initial training. They go through that apprenticeship process. But um, it is possible for someone to be a great coach who leads our small group leaders or crew or a great senior coach who leads other coaches um, and have never actually led a small group. As long as they understand our mission, vision and values and, uh, you know, they've got the capability there. So we really look anywhere. We'll turn over any rock that we can. But we're looking for people who are, you know, they're ready to learn. They don't feel like they they know everything, but they are highly passionate. They're driven and they're going to do whatever it takes to you know get to get the job done. So they're going to look at what we're asking of them, and they're going to come up with a good game plan to love on their people well, to do it with passion. And uh, the rest of the stuff you can teach, but you just can't teach passion, and you you know you can't teach that initial capability to step into leading other people. 
Yeah, I th- our coaches are probably a mix like like yours. You know, some had done it, some had had done the role they're, role they're coaching in, some had not. And we had Tom Shevchunas on the podcast, and he talked about how uh, most of theirs now had not been small group leaders. They had a hard time getting small group leaders to you know take on that coach role and mm-hmm. you know, be great at it. So I, I think it is just a mix. I think churches just have to figure out what's going to work best for them. I'd love to dig into the uh, that process of onboarding. So the four week training, six week apprenticeship, and it sounds like you do that again with coaches. Sure. And I think uh, people would love to hear. I certainly would love to hear what that looks like in detail. It sounds like you have um, four weeks where you're training them. They're not necessarily in the environment. Six weeks they're in the ministry alongside someone who does it. But have you developed? Uh, curriculum for lack of a better term here's what we're going to teach you during that time and is that so, like a documented thing that you know somebody's going through with them both in the training and in the apprenticeship how does that work absolutely uh you know we have we're a multi-site church we have five campuses that have student ministries that run um, and they vary you know pretty greatly in size and we all do the same thing run the same process so um, instead of constantly training, because that's kind of the point where we had gotten to, you know, early last year, we were training people every single week. We were training new volunteers every single week as we were growing and we had new needs and we were, you know, replacing at times other people who had stepped out for a season. Um, and, you know, it just gets taxing doing that. So one of the steps we took was we went to video training and we had our global student pastor, Zach Stevens, actually videoed the trainings that we already had in place. You know, we had um, workbooks that the new leaders would actually work through and you know, we had all that information. So we went ahead and put that on video so that everybody across all of our campuses gets the exact same training. And it's a lot easier for us to get another volunteer and empower them to start that video and then have those conversations afterwards than it is for a student pastor or a higher level you know, senior coach to be in the room every single time that we're you know, training or onboarding brand new volunteers. So, uh, you know, we do it by video. And really what we do for the first week when they come in is we have a quick video from our pastor that really just sets the stage for how our church views, you know, student ministry. And um, he tells them that he really believes that what we do is the tip of the spear, uh, you know, for the church and um, how thankful he is, you know, for them. And then from that point, we place them with a host. We have some volunteers that host them and take them on a tour every single uh, week where we have new volunteers, and they just kind of show them the ins and outs of what student ministry looks like in our building on a Wednesday night, give them need to know information. Uh, then from that point, they actually take them and they fill out their paperwork, all the admin, logistics stuff. So filling out background checks, their volunteer application, all that important stuff that gives us information we need, uh, you know, really to pray through the process um, and help figure out over that time you know, where we need to place them. Part of that is an interview um, with some of our existing leaders and coaches who uh, a lot of times we do that during our middle school hour and we have a high school hour of small groups after our service. So we'll take high school leaders and coaches that, you know, have gotten there early and they'll do a lot of those interviews, you know, for us just to get a feel for the person and to help them really find their best spot, not just fill a hole, but we want them to find a place where they're going to thrive, you know, over the next week. So, we do that, and then they actually go into our student ministry service and get to sit through the environment without a responsibility. So we have a specific section where we allow them to sit since they're not background checked yet, most of them, um, and they just get to get a feel for it. Is this really for me? This is what the environment looks like, and they see us dismissed as small groups. Uh, for the next three weeks, they come in, and we have about a 45-minute training and a 15-20 you know, minute discussion that the facilitator goes through with them, answers their questions. And we hit, you know, three very different things. And you can kind of come in at any point during that process. But we talk about, you know, um, kind of a manual that we have and a counseling booklet that we've designed. How would you lead a student to Christ? How would you answer the tough questions that are going to come your way? And, and how do you handle those in a crisis moment? We give them that tool and walk through how we use that, make sure that everybody's on the same page. Uh, we go through our volunteer manual and um, just kind of the commitment of a volunteer and what that looks like and the different roles that that you can fill and and how that actually accomplishes you know um, the ministry and just uh, a little bit of vision and overall as well of what we're about where we're going and then we outline one week of just the apprenticeship process to let them know 
what their next steps are going to look like, how we're going to apprentice them, walk with them. Um, so, you know, we tell them all about it. The apprenticeship process is uh, four to six weeks of walking with someone who's already doing your role. And we break it down really into to four different parts of that apprenticeship. You know, the first week that, for instance, a small group leader sits in, um, our language and kind of the lingo that we use is you sit in that first week with the leader that's apprenticing you, and it's kind of a I do, you watch, we talk mentality. Um, you're there really just to watch and to see how they interact in small group. And then afterwards, you're going to have that discussion together on, hey, what'd you see? What questions do you have? And they're, you know, that leader's going to pour into you. The next week, it's I do, you know, you help. And then we talk. So the new apprentice is able to chime in in places and help a little bit. They may take a, a very small piece of, you know, kind of the group guide for that night. But then afterwards, they're still going to have that conversation. And then from there, it escalates into the, the next two weeks, which is you do, I help, we talk. So, you know, finally, the apprentice is leading on their own, but they're right there. They've got someone to, to help them if they fall. Um, and to help kind of turn the conversations as they maybe struggle through it. And then they talk about it afterwards with coaching. And uh, the last week when they finally feel like they're ready, uh, that they have to get through is you do, I watch, we talk. And it's completely on the apprentice with the other person there, but they're not really going to step in. They're not going to help unless there's an emergency. Um, so, you know, we have a whole training on what that looks like. So they know what to expect so that when they get into the apprenticeship process, they have a really good idea of what it's going to look like. They can hit the ground running and really focus on receiving that coaching from the existing leader who's apprenticing them. Um, so that's kind of our process. We put them in that apprenticing process for four weeks to six weeks, depending on how fast they progress. And at that point, we make a permanent placement uh, for them with whatever group or whatever role that they're going to be in. That's good. We use that same language. You know, I think that's helpful that I do. You, know, you watch, we talk kind of thing. Do you train up? Um, the people who are apprenticing in a different way, or is it because they went through it and they've done the role for a while, they just know how to apprentice other people? Mm -hmm. Well, in our training process, you know, we have a whole week on what apprenticing looks like. So we've set the kind of the base for that. And as we go forward, you know, with people and we're kind of tapping people on the shoulder and saying, Hey, we would like for you to apprentice someone. They've already heard it and they've been through it. So they know what it looks like. They know what the expectation is. So oftentimes it's just a refresher, really, you know, from the leader of saying, hey, here are the things I want you to um, be mindful of. Here are the things I want you to remember. Um, and often the conversations that we're having, rather than it being a separate training, it's a refresher. It's a reminder. And then we're looking very specifically at the um, kind of the personal makeup or the relational makeup of the person that they're apprenticing. You know, we want to help make sure we're setting them up to win relationally with that person. Um, and that when that apprentice comes in for the first week, they've got someone who really knows, you know, kind of who they are, what their dreams and aspirations are within the ministry. And then they help them go from there. Cool. And I'd love to hear, so you talked about the coaches and that's a common, I think, um, term people are using is they're putting this volunteer level of leadership in between, you know, the leader who's on the front lines and maybe themselves as a staff person. Mm -hmm. But you said you also have senior coaches you know, who lead other coaches. So in terms of just numbers, um, structure and all that kind of stuff, what does that look like? How many, uh, you know, how many small group leaders does a coach lead? How many coaches does a senior coach lead? And all of that, it sounds like mm -hmm. is not, it's all volunteers. So then, and then I imagine staff, somebody on staff leads senior coaches, right? Sure. Absolutely. You know, we have, um, we, we've, we've been bumping up right around 600 students lately. We have about 55, small groups right now um, that are growing. We're actually getting ready to, uh, to birth and multiply uh, more of those small groups. So we try to have two leaders per small group. Uh, that way, if one's not there, the other one is. And so that they can really have a group of you know, 12 or less that they're connecting with and, and they're partnering with. Uh, and we have that across all grades. So you know, we have six through 12th grade. Every grade has at least one coach. Every grade and gender has at least one coach. So sixth grade boys has a coach and sixth grade girls, you know, has a coach. Some of our grades have gotten so big that we've actually given them multiple coaches because we don't really want a coach trying to lead. We really want the sweet spots five to seven, you know, small group leaders. If they get above that, it gets really hard to pour into them at the level that we want. Like we want our coaches 
to be the ones that, you know, when there's crisis in a volunteer's life, we want one of the first people they call outside of maybe their own small group leader you know, from their adult small group. We want it to be their coach, somebody that just cares about them on a deep level, somebody that's going to know what's going on with them and, and pray for them or pray with them. And um, But then they're also helping, you know, make logistical decisions that don't need to come all the way up to, you know, one of our student pastors or, you know, something like that. So uh, we try to keep it in that five to seven range. So, you know, if we have more than four groups in a grade, then that's when we actually need to get another coach trained and onboarded. And then from there, with just the number of coaches, you know, that we have, that's more people than really I can, I can shepherd well. You know, I can't shepherd, you know, 20 people well, in addition to the staff that I'm already, you know, shepherding and already leading. So we wanted to put another layer in that to make this thing, you know, really scalable and sustainable over the long haul. Um, because if we're going to sustain to, you know, growth to 700 students or to 800 students at this campus, and if we're going to try to figure that out for the other campuses as well, there has to be another layer um, kind of in between us. That's where the senior coaches roll in. And again, with the senior coaches, right now we have a senior coach for um, high school girls, high school guys, middle school girls, middle school guys, leaders. Um, and that's kind of where we're at. Um, so those four senior coaches can break that down into a much more manageable number of about five coaches that they have and that they work with and, and just help them grow through the process. So it's made a huge difference for us because I can pour into my four senior coaches um, at a much better level than I could pour into 20 or so coaches. So everybody's cared for. And if everybody's cared for, they lead at a much higher level. That's great. That's a big responsibility in terms of volunteer leadership. It is for a coach as well. But to then be a senior coach, I think it's good for people to hear because that allows you to have less staff. You know, a lot, a lot of times a church may staff an extra role to lead those 20 coaches. Sure. You know what I mean? And, and do it that way. And I don't know if it's about right and wrong, but certainly that definitely saves money on the church side when you have volunteers doing that that you can then you know put somewhere else. That's cool. Absolutely, we run really lean. Um, you know, to be a, a large campus and a large student ministry, um, I'm the only full time staff member that we have. Now we have a couple of other full time equivalents based on part time staff that's helping us, um, but even most of our part time staff they have global roles across the other campuses as well. And just having high quality leaders who've kind of come through our ranks, some of them, some of them that haven't been with us for so long, but have come in to, to help us. But having leaders who lead leaders and leaders who will sit down and have the hard conversations they need to or leaders who, you know, at that coach level will take their small group leaders out to lunch and, and just hang out with them and get to know them a little better, find out about their passions and, and coach them that way. Uh, that has made a huge difference for us because you know, we can do things that would require triple the staff probably a lot of other places. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing because it's also very sustainable that it's led by, you know, those high quality volunteers. And uh, then if they're ever ready to go to another area of ministry within our church, man, they're ready. They're ready. We know they're going to represent the the church. Well, we know they've been trained well. So it's a, a great, you know, kind of breeding ground for uh, volunteers who will eventually become leaders of our next campuses. They're going to become student pastors at uh, some of the next campuses that we launch, they're going to become, you know, staff members in our groups department and new campuses. So um, we love that. And uh, that's honestly been something we've seen a lot of lately. We've seen coaches and senior coaches who are taking on staff roles with us. So it's helping us to develop a whole new uh, kind of level of leader within our church. That's great. And I don't want people to miss too the kind of all the pieces of it. Cause I think a lot of churches are um, working on this right now. And what I would call it mm -hmm. is the leadership pipeline. And you have that, you have, your leadership pipeline is you know, small group leader, led by a coach, led by a senior coach, led by staff. You have a process for bringing them on, for training. There's content that you've identified, like here's what we want to train them. We have some of it's on video, some of it's live, um, some of it's in a handbook or you know, a printed kind of format. And, and that, so that all of that together works to make this leadership development system right work. And mm -hmm. sometimes I think people think it's it's like a they're not sure it's a mystery. How do I develop leaders? And you're not leaning on individuals and individual talent as much as you're leaning on this whole system that you've developed, right? Yeah, absolutely. The system itself, uh, the system itself attracts leaders. 
you know, great leaders want to be where they're going to receive great responsibility and they're going to be a part of something, you know, big. So, you know, I think that our current system attracts higher quality leaders than anything that I've ever been a part of before, uh, just because there's, there's a way for you to move along. There's a way for you to take on more as you get ready. There's, you know, kind of those moving pieces so that someone doesn't just you know, do the same role for five years and burn out if they're ready to, to take more. And when we get people in because of this development process, you know, everybody's got somebody who's meeting with them. Everybody's got someone who's, who's kind of pushing on those growth areas and encouraging them to take the next step and believing in them. So because of that, you know, I can only develop a few people, but because everybody in our organization is being developed at some level or another, we're not missing as many future quality leaders. We're identifying, hey, this is a potential staff person, or we're identifying this is a potential coach really early in the process. And uh, well before we ask them to take those steps, oftentimes we'll just call it out in them and say, hey, we believe if you keep moving and you keep growing um, that you can get here and we really want to help you get here. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just been incredible. The process really, I think, breeds more success as people come in through it. Yeah, and I think it's important, too, regardless of church size. I mean, certainly, yes, at a certain size, you can handle a lot more as a staff person. But if you want to help it grow and you want to reach more students who are not a part of any church and connect them to Jesus, you want to put this stuff in place early. I mean, you could have 30 students, six small group leaders. And you know what? I'm going to go find a coach for those six small group leaders so that I can also spend time on other things. Right. And grow that. And when it's 60 students and 12 small group leaders and maybe it's two coaches, uh, like you can start this early, and sometimes, kind of like you're saying, the system itself and just putting this whole thing in place attracts more leaders, and I think all of that helps it grow, right? I think we've even seen that in the Bible, too. That's really cool. So I want to shift gears and talk about student leadership. So this is a great model of how you develop you know, volunteers. What about students who want to serve, who want to lead? How do you develop students in your ministry? Sure. Uh, before I jump into that, um, actually, Nick, I want to you know just kind of remind of thinking about you know the listeners and probably something I left out that was important on that last one is you know our campuses they range from you know thirty students to sixty students to you know one hundred and forty students and this is something that has worked for us and that we utilize at every level. So we've got that campus of you know thirty who has the one coach who has taken some stuff off the plate of the student pastor so that they can focus on what's most important and what only they can do. Um, You know, and we have at at the campus that's, you know, a little over a hundred, they're already starting to identify senior coaches, you know, so they can, again, make sure that everybody's cared for. So yeah, at any level this works. And the earlier you start it, the more successful I think you're going to be with it in the future. If you wait until you need it, that's almost too late. Yeah. You've probably limited growth a little bit at that point, which you don't even know. Like you can't, it's hard to measure that, but yeah. Um, on the student side, man, I, I love it. This student leadership is is my passion. You know, I've been at Faith Promise for about a year now, and uh, you know, I was talking with a couple of the other people. You know, my boss and uh, one of our assistants in the office, and just really looking over this past year and saying, where did we make the biggest impact? Where did I make the biggest impact as a leader? And the place that I identified, and hands down, you know, others have agreed with it. The biggest impact that I've been able to make in a year of leadership here is raising the level of student leadership. Um, And honestly, man, a lot of times it's just happened by accident because it's it's something that's kind of ingrained in me. But we're trying to make this systematized, really make it a process that other people can follow. So, you know, what we want to do is at every level, whether it's student ministry or, you know, big church, you know, type deal, we want to encourage students to go ahead and serve, to utilize their gifts and uh, instead of using them to fill a spot that, you know, we have a hole, we think they can fill that need, we're usually looking for, hey, what's something they can do? And uh, oftentimes we're making positions, you know, for students to step into. But it starts on the weekend, the hour, man, our leadership, they're so incredible. There's, there's nothing that a student can't do on the weekend if they go through the training that an adult goes through. You know, so we have students who are running, you know, cameras that cost thousands of dollars, you know, on the weekend. And they're running audio and lighting, but, you know, they're a huge part of our kids ministry that high school students who are small group leaders for our kids ministry and middle school students who are helping serve in our preschool ministry, you know, and then we even have, you know, teams that just serve in the lobby. We have a a team called a weekend team right now that is just students who are 
greeting other students in the lobby. They're going to pray with students as they're being baptized. You know, their whole job is just to be relational on, you know, Sunday mornings and, and on our weekend services. And it's totally changed the energy of the weekend. You know, everybody notices it and they know, you know, hey, I can ask this student about another part of the church and they're going to know the answers. You know, they, they're highly trained people. So and that really just came from, you know, a person who had an idea and a student ran with it and started that team. And, you know, we just kind of coached him. So some of that stuff has happened organically. But we've really tried to bring up a leadership pipeline with our students as well. So and we do it in a couple of ways. Um, one is we do, you know, a leadership event each year where you know, we invite the students who are serious about taking that next step in their leadership. It's not an event where we want a thousand people to come to. It's an event we want, you know, our top leaders to come to. We want students who who say, I think I could lead, but I don't know what that looks like. But I want to take a bigger role. And, you know, we spend a weekend over that event just pouring belief into them, pouring leadership principles into them. And we kind of give them a challenge of what it looks like to take their next step. Um, So when we leave an event like that, you know the students who um, are going to be really your next high-level leaders because they're the ones who take that step and really kind of carve out roles for themselves. So, you know, we talk to them about availability and we talk to them about finding a place and and getting involved. But, you know, I love it. This year after we did this event, I had a young lady who came to me and uh, she knew that just a couple of weeks later, one of our student interns was going to be, you know, out of town. And she knew that we were going to be in a little bit of a bind because she has real responsibility that you know, we were going to have to uh, take up on a week where we were short staffed. So she came to me and she said, you know, Pastor Jeff, I want to be her on that week. You know, I'm just going to hang around for the next couple of weeks. I'm going to learn what she does and uh, then I'm going to fill that role. You know, because that was kind of the, some of the things that we had talked about over that leadership weekend was not waiting until someone taps you on the shoulder, but finding a place and believing in yourself and taking that step. So, you know, she did that. And now she's a student that actually serves with us on a weekly basis. And, um, you know, she comes in and serves at a high level with our you know, next steps ministry and in our groups ministry. You know, so we've got organic situations like that. But then we've got, you know, programs that we run um, uh, internship during the school year for students, as well as an internship during the summer for students where we identify some of our, our highest level student leaders. They have to apply for it. It's, it's not necessarily an easy process to get into, uh, but we're, we're very selective and we try to take five to seven each semester. And uh, what we really do is we spend a lot of time just doing leadership development type classes with them, you know, talking to them about how to communicate with adults, talking to them, you know, about how do I lead a team and how do I care for people. Uh, and then outside of that, we give them and you know, we give them the normal tasks. They're putting down chairs and, and things like that and they're picking up trash. But everybody gets a meaningful project that really moves our ministry forward. It's the type of project that we would, you know, we used to would give to adults, but now we give it to them. So, um, you know, one of those projects has been a, a student ran our social media accounts for an entire summer and had a goal to, you know, to grow those by, you know, a couple of hundred followers. And they did, you know, we've had, uh, students who are setting up new curriculum for us right now. I have a student who, uh, you know, they're in the internship program and they're, challenge their project for the semester was to start a student devotional that we could put on our student ministry app and get into students hands written for students by students and um, so we've helped her put together a team and she's doing that and so when we develop these higher level student leaders so we develop anyone who's interested in leadership kind of in that pipeline of um, our rise up event you know in the in the fall And then from there, all year long, we're developing a different crew of higher capacity student leaders who want to take the next step. And then we send them out and without fail, almost every time when they stop their internship with us, they're starting a team that's doing something new, that's meeting a new role and recruiting new leaders who didn't exactly know which step to take. But maybe we're at that, you know, at that event and and they're just they're chomping at the bit. So. Um, it, it's really cool that you know now we're seeing if we pour into our highest level student leaders, they will pour into others, and it, it starts that recruiting pipeline itself. Um, but the best way that we can do it is we just find you know a couple of the best that we can find, pour into them, and then challenge them to pour into others. That's good, and it, and it sounds like, and I just want to ask this so people understand that you know as they listen to it and think about their ministry, 
Sure. It's not like you're, you're, you're getting a third of your students through this program. You're, you're specifically inviting high-level leaders. And I know this is a rough guess off, you know, off the cuff, but what percentage of your students actually come to rise up the, the leader retreat and then, mm-hmm. you know, and then start to take steps from there? It's probably pretty small, right, because you're focusing on leadership development. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's under 20%, and we bill that event as uh, – we, we don't bill it with any fun. You know, it's a serious leadership. If you want to grow, if you want to go to the next level in your leadership and your walk with God, this is that event for you. But it's one of the few events where we don't even tell them what we're doing for fun. And we have fun events there, but we don't want to tell them what we're doing because we don't want anybody there for that reason. So, and, uh, you know, we kind of push back on it a little bit. You know, I remember this year, you know, from the stage and some student services saying, hey, we only want you if you're serious about this. Um so that's kind of the beginning of that process. It doesn't mean that every student that goes through it is going to become you know, this incredibly high-level leader. But out of that, we identify a couple of things. One, are we identify students who need to be serving somewhere, need to be volunteering somewhere, and right now aren't. So for them, that's their leadership step. You know, but the other thing we identify is we identify those that have been serving that want something more. Um, so from there, that's where we kind of bring in that handful of students. And, you know, it's just kind of become a, a deal with us here um, at Faith Promise. But not only that, it's really, you know, the the last church I was at where I spent six years, you know, there we were, you know, about 85 students. But there are always a handful of students who are around the office who are being developed. Um, and then when they're developed and when they're ready, they take, you know, a, a bigger chunk of that. And we encourage them to go out and develop other people. So, Right now, we have you know five students for the semester that are on board of that who are doing really special things, who are um, you know kind of training up some students behind them, and because of that, some of the students that they've spent time with, you know, have already started contacting us and saying, "Hey, in January, do you have any openings where we could come help?" And it's just really volunteer roles where we let them have a little more access. And um, man, again, they're they're making a huge difference. It's not just our coaches and senior coaches where we see potential future staff. Um, but we've actually got, you know, someone who, uh, a young man right now who's on staff at one of our other campuses as a an associate student pastor, and he's there because he came out of the student ministry, um, and he was someone who we just kept giving more and more of these roles to, and uh, proved himself as just an incredible leader, and, you know, and so now he's serving as a student pastor at one of our campuses. So it's it's an incredible pipeline for students, not just leaders. Yeah, that's awesome. Do you guys, since you value students serving so much, and churches do this different ways. Uh, but I love to ask and, you know, see what other churches do. A lot of times, you know, to measure health, we'll measure different things. And most people measure, like, attendance. <laughs> you know, that's the big mm-hmm. one. But if you try to dig in, you, you try to measure some other things, like small group involvement or whatever. Do you measure how many students serve as a either as a ratio of, like, total student average or, you know, the total number of students that attend mm-hmm. that are involved? Do you do that at all? And is, are there goals with that? Or is it more just... We're trying to get all students to serve and, you know, not so much setting a goal or whatever, just trying to take each student and help them take a step. Mm -hmm. For us, I think it's, you know, we have goals that are are set really all around that. They're all around that leadership development principle. So there's not a specific student serving goal right now, um, but we do track our volunteers and growing, you know, growing volunteers are serving. But the big number that we track with our students that has been a game changer for us is the percentage of students who come on Wednesday nights to student ministry that are engaged in the weekend, in the larger church body. Um, And that's where we get a lot of those numbers because most of those students, like 90% of them, are serving on the weekend. Um, If they're serving on the weekend, they're almost all serving on Wednesday nights as well. So we track that percentage and we've watched it kind of steadily increase. And you know, we have a goal that we want 75% of the students who are here on a Wednesday night serving and engaged on the weekend. So, you know, we, we push for that. We don't want it to get too high because if, you know, if we get to 90% of our students are, are serving on the weekend and engaged on the weekend, well, that tells us we're probably not reaching a lot of unchurched students at that point because that's, you know, a process. So it's a fine line. It's a delicate balance, but that is, um, you know, out of all of our metrics and all the things that we measure, we kind of weight them. And that is the most important goal that we have is connection and engagement on the weekend, um, which directly correlates to student serving. That's good. Plus, you know that it'll help them stick long term in the church because when they graduate, 
they're engaged already. And absolutely, like around, which is good. Um, but you know, with the little bit of time we have left, we could use a whole podcast on this for sure. But I just love to ask, you know, we talked about leadership development and how, uh, it enables you to reach more students and to grow the student ministry. But as the ministry grows, systems have to grow too. And, and in fact, sometimes systems just have to change. <laughs> you know, the one that worked absolutely with 50 students doesn't work with 500. So just generally speaking, um, how do you grow? How have you grown your systems or how have they changed? And what does that look like to make sure it's keeping up and it's not getting in the way? Sure. Um, well, the good news is, you know, my, my first two stops in student ministry, I was charged with starting something from scratch, which means that, you know, I've started systems from scratch, uh, which is really just a fancy way of saying I did it all wrong at least twice. Um, so, you know, I've learned from that. And, you know, what I've learned after doing this kind of twice from the ground up is that I would have really good systems and, and strategies that seemed to work and they were great. We would hit explosive growth for a little while and then we would hit like a hard cap and overnight it would seem like we just, we couldn't grow. We couldn't impact more students. We couldn't reach more families. Um, and, and it kept happening. And what I would realize as those things happened is I'd have to go back to my volunteer teams and say, you know what? I kind of missed the boat on this. I designed everything around a system that would work for where we were at then. Um, But it had a shelf life and it's not, it's not going to take us to the next level. So one of the things that I started working on a couple of years ago, and this is something that I've really brought to, to faith promise because we're in this, we're in this kind of season of man, you know, our, our campus is large and it's growing. So our next steps have to be very strategic to make sure that we're doing this well and that we're doing it in a sustainable way that in a model that our other campuses can follow behind. Cause we're not just thinking about ourselves. I can't just think about my campus. I have to think about, you know, the student pastors and campuses that are coming behind us. We want to blaze this trail for them. You know, so what I'm looking at with scalable systems, the first thing is I want to design a system with the end in mind. It can't all be all about the now. So, you know, I used to do this all the time. It was what is our best way to grow right now? But unfortunately, the best way to grow right now this month is often not the best system for your long-term future as a student ministry. Um, and I would rather you know see a slower growth rate over the first five, six months, but long-term know this is something that's going to work for years to come and uh, you know utilize it. So at that point, when you do that, you hit a, a system that allows you where you would normally hit the lid to hit explosive growth. And over time, you actually grow more by thinking about, you know, the end in mind. So I always try to think, what's that next milestone, the next couple of milestones that we're looking at? So, you know, if it's a if your church of 15 and you're thinking, hey, if we could just have 50 students, that would be incredible. That's that that milestone. Or if we could just have 30 students active, that would be this big milestone for us. Whatever that thing is that you're praying for, that you're begging God for, that just seems like it would be a dream come true. You got to ask yourself the question. Would our current systems work if we were that size? What would have to change? And you want to try to come up with with systems that you're not overhauling, but you're actually just multiplying to. So for you know, for instance, our system we talked about, you know, having our small group leaders and coaches. Well, our campuses from the time they hit about 30 have a coach because they know as we grow, we'll multiply that and we'll have senior coaches. We'll have more coaches and then we'll have uh, you know, senior coaches on top of that. And we have a, a strategy to multiply something versus them knowing, Hey, if we grow by 50, 60 students, then we got to overhaul this whole thing. Um, and really kind of the, the biggest key to this whole thing is that scalable systems, when you're trying to start something that's going to work for the long haul, they got to be process driven over people driven. Um, you know, so many student ministries that I see, and I've been guilty of this in the past, but they're, really centered around one person on a stage. You know, they're centered around that one personality of the student pastor. And if if that person bails, then, you know, the whole thing changes and the whole environment changes. Um, You know, good scalable systems are not centered around people. They're centered around processes that develop other people. You know, so for us, man, you know, I just look at it. If, If I wasn't here this week, our student ministry would be just as good, um, you know, as if I were here. I don't think anyone would really notice I was gone. You know, um, if, if I wasn't here for a while, no one would notice for about six to eight weeks. And that's because the maintenance and the upkeep and the development kind of from the top. But um, it's our processes and the people those processes are developing, the other people they're empowering that I think make systems 
incredibly sustainable over the long haul and scalable as you grow. So you kind of build them around a process that works and not a person or a personality. And so if you, when you talk about processes and have them, you know, that they can be replicated and they help you scale, do, are they, are these like documented things that like, you know, here's a written way that we, um, on, you know, reach out to new students, you know, who've come and follow up with them. Here's an, here's a new way that we, because obviously we talked about leadership development. That's fairly documented. So are the other mm-hmm. ones documented too? Like there's, it's written down somewhere. You know, it's typed up and you can hand it to someone and here's how we follow up with students who haven't been in three weeks mm-hmm. you know, or something like that. Absolutely. Um, and, and again, man, it's most of what I've learned, Nick, is from the big mistakes that I've made. And that's why, you know, why I'm doing something like why I'm lead right now um, is I want to help student pastors outside of just faith promise. But all across the country, I want youth workers to be able to avoid the mistakes that I made and really just be able to see that success earlier, uh, be able to impact as many families as possible. And, uh, you know, for us, when we're looking at, at systems, one of the things that I learned a few years ago the hard way was, you know, hey, if I started thinking about it, my pastor challenged me, if you left the church today, who would know what we're doing? Who would know how to continue these great systems that you've got. And he really challenged me. So today we kind of operate off of this mantra. If it's not written down, you don't have a system. If it's not written down, you don't have a process that that works within that system. So we try to write everything down once we've worked the major kinks out of it. So anything new that we do, um, we're going to take it to about whoever's responsible for it. So if I've got a project, I'm going to take it to about 80% completion. And then I'm going to take it to our global student pastor. He and I are going to tweak it and take it to about 90%. And then we're going to get feedback from, you know, the other student pastors. And then we're going to take it all the way up. We're going to finish this thing out. And once it's finished and we agree, this is a workable, scalable system, we write it down, we globalize it, um, not only for our other campuses, but to share with other student ministries and other people who ask, Hey, how, how do we do this? Because, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever run into this, but I'll forget six months later, how the how a process works that I wrote that I designed, you know. So writing it down is huge for us, and having that there. And then if I've got to pass the baton to somebody else, or I take on a new responsibility, the ministry is not going to miss a beat because everything is is laid out there step by step of how we do it. That's great. That's great. And I could ask a million more questions about this. Like I said, it could be another podcast. But this is this has been really helpful, and I think what we've done is taken your leadership development system, you know, as an example of this and kind of broken that down, which I think is great. I think a lot of leaders are going to listen to this and be able to take it and apply it to their ministry, which is awesome. Jeff, if, it, if people you know, want to connect with you, if they have more questions, how can they do that? Uh, sure. They can follow me on social media. It's uh, jco, jco330. Um, or they can you know, email me here at Faith Promise. It's jeffc at faithpromise.org. We love to help other student you know, leaders and, and, and family ministries. So if there's ever any question about what we do or any of the systems that we talked about, they can email me directly there. I would love to you know, answer those questions. Or they can connect with me at uh, YM Lead. Um, I write multiple times a week for YM Lead um, on blog posts and just different things like that. We're actually getting ready to give away a huge a bundle of resources just kind of as a Christmas giveaway to new subscribers and to existing subscribers to help them win. I mean, that's going to include a, a new ebook that I've just written on goals and goal setting for the year that I think will really help um, some student pastors, and student ministries take that next step. So I think connect with me. I'm writing there or just give me a shout on email. Would love to connect with them and help anybody any way we can. Awesome, Jeff. Thanks so much. Really appreciate your time. All right. Thanks. I believe what Jeff said there near the end, that if it's not written down, it's not really a system, it's not really a process, and it's not about becoming some kind of corporate organization where we're all just following these rules and practices and checklists. It's really about making ministry less dependent on us and more something that can be reproduced and shared and everybody can take part in, something that's easy to take and then train a new volunteer with. And so be sure to check the show notes at nickblevins.com slash episode 32 to get all that stuff that Jeff shared, you know, volunteer onboarding documents, applications, checklists for volunteers, uh, the ebook that he mentioned about setting goals. So you can get all of that in the show notes. A couple action items that I think you could take coming out of the interview include defining your structure. You know, he walked through his leadership structure with coaches and senior coaches and all that. So what is yours? 
And if you don't have one now, which I think a lot of churches probably don't, why don't you create it? What, what does it look like? What could the structure of leadership look like if you were to hand off some leadership to volunteers? Another action item, of course, is to document your processes and your systems. Everything from how do we set up, you know, before it begins and how do we tear down to what should we do midweek to prepare, you know, for the gathering or for small group or whatever it might be. It's really important to document those things and you don't have to do it. I think that's the thing I would recommend is who can you find? Who's a volunteer who could really do that well? Pay attention to detail and document that for you over time. It's not something you have to get done in a month, obviously, but that's a big step we could take. And then, of course, get all those resources from the show notes that Jeff shared and maybe even that goals ebook and use that as we head into 2017. So I hope that's really helpful to you. Be sure to subscribe. In the next episode, I talk with Corey Jones and Corey and I walk through kind of his week. Like how does he work? What does productivity look like for him? What are some tips and tricks and things that he's learned? I'm always interested in hearing how others work so I can steal their good ideas and use them so I can be more productive. And so Corey shares, you know, what his week looks like, how that's evolved. And I think that'd be really helpful. Maybe something you're working on as we head into a new year is how to be more productive and efficient with your time. And if that's the case, you don't want to miss that episode. So be sure to subscribe and we'll see you next week in the Family Ministry Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. We hope this helps you maximize your church's potential. We would love to hear stories of how you apply what you've learned. You can do that by leaving a comment on iTunes or in the show notes at nickblevins.com.